Welcome to Shootin' Straight. I'm your host, Ken Buck. In today's highly partisan environment, political adversaries often minimize each other's arguments by labeling motives rather than engaging in constructive dialogue. For the next 30 minutes or so, I invite you to join me as we learn about Megan Cox Gurdon and how she has become one of the nation's leading advocates for the benefits of reading aloud to children. Many of us know Megan as the Wall Street Journal's children's book reviewer for the past 16 years. We will learn how Megan's work in this field has helped families implement reading programs in their own homes. We will also get her take on the increasingly alarming infiltration of liberal viewpoints into children's literature. It is my pleasure to welcome Megan Cox Gurdon to the show. Are you ready to start shooting straight? I'm ready to be shot. <laughs> uh, no, don't say that. <laughs> no, but, I'm absolutely. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So, so tell me, uh, why passion for children's literature? Ah, uh, well, I, I think like so many things in life, it goes back to my earliest days. I was read to certainly as a child by my parents, though I don't have any memory of that because my parents, like many parents, uh, and I think this is a mistake, uh, they. Well, soon they, they stopped reading to me as soon as I could read for myself. Um, one of the things that I talk about in my book, The Enchanted Hour, is there are extraordinary benefits that accrue to families uh, from continuing reading long after a child can read to his or herself. But that's that we'll get into that later. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I feel that my childhood was formed by children's literature. Uh, the characters that I met in books, the struggles that they encountered, very much informed my own life and, you know, enriched it. And uh, so I've always loved children's books since I was a child. I was a huge consumer of children's books. Uh, and then when I uh, grew up and had five children, it was um, a love that I extended to them and made reading a loud part of their lives from the moment they arrived. Interesting. So did anyone else read to you besides uh, your parents? Do you know, I think my grandmother, my father's mother did. Uh, I'm pretty sure I remember her reading me the story about Ping, um, which is a very old and wonderful picture book about a little duck on the Yangtze River in China. Um, so I do remember that. But other than that, I don't I'm not sure that anyone did. What, one of the guests I've had on the show uh, uh, was Ben Carson and and just really loved his story about his mom laying down the law and telling him you will read two books a day you will only watch tv for two hours a day and uh, you'll write a book report you'll you'll actually learn as you're reading and write this book report for and she was illiterate she understood the importance of reading um and and we'll get into reading aloud as, as a separate issue but uh, why is reading so important? You know, that's uh, I, Ben Carson's experience is uh, so inspiring and arresting. Uh, it, I think that modern parents are afraid to tell their children what to do. Sometimes we're afraid. Indeed, in our schools, people are afraid to to require of children that they read demanding literature for fear that it put them off reading. Um, and so his case shows us that, you know, introducing children's books early and insisting, as it were, or making it part of the family culture to read them, uh, you know, has this way of infusing a child's life with the stories, the, you know, the conflicts, the dramatic settings that I talked about a moment ago, but also with the richness of language that books make available to us. You know, in our ordinary life, we use a relatively small number of words, but books, even picture books, are absolutely loaded with unusual vocabulary. And so when children are being read to, when they're reading for themselves, they're picking up sort of the rules of grammar and syntax and, and getting vocabulary clues from context uh, that allows them to develop really, you know, develop their, their full literacy, uh, not just in the sense that they can uh, read and make sense of what they're reading and hearing and seeing, um, but also cultural literacy. You know, they, they get the stories that help form the people who formed the culture around them. And there's a wonderful grounding quality to that. So when I was growing up, I, I heard stories. Uh, you know, I, I, I might have been in, in Sunday school and church and, and someone read uh, a story about Jesus to me, or, or I might have been, um, you know, uh, with some, uh, some friends and someone told me about a basketball game that occurred or, or something, but we grow up with stories. Where, where did you grow up? 
Oh, well, all right. Two things I want to say first. Sure. On the, on the subject of, of growing up with stories, I mean, you are absolutely right. It's something very profound to the, to, the, to the nature of humanity. Storytelling is how we understand the world. Storytelling is one of the human universals in every culture ever recorded. It isn't almost part of the DNA. I mean, I think if oh, we absolutely. ever get to that point, we'd figure out that, that it's been going on for so many centuries that well, it's become part of our well, DNA. Well, look at, look at the cave paintings, you know, from, from, from prehistory. Those tell stories. We, storytelling is, you're right, it's part of our DNA. And uh, it, it comes naturally to us. And the storytelling that you experienced as a child, you know, you were probably hearing most of it through your ears. You were making sense of spoken of spoken words, of speech. Speech is our native language. You know, storytelling is our native way of talking. And speech is the way that we naturally in, in exchange learning. it. And learning, exactly. And, yeah. and, you know, that's how we all pick up our native languages, unless we are are deaf, that's a separate question. But for most people, we learn our native tongue by hearing it. And then only later do we learn to speak it. And we hear it in the context of stories. So yes, it's absolutely, it's elemental. It's, it's, um, it's very natural to us. It, it, um, and it's, and it's easy. And this is one of the, not to get too far ahead of myself, one of the magical things about reading to a child is that you are presenting stories in this natural form a way that is easy for a child to make sense of because it comes in the way that speech does as as the as the word spoken aloud mm -hmm. so to your other question where did i grow up so i i am i uh, i am sort of a child of the 70s i was born in the mid 60s um but you know was an actual child in the 70s uh, only child broken home lived all over moved around new england uh with my my, with first one parent, then the other. But I sort of date my my grounding as a person to when being the age of 12, I moved to Maine with my father, who had quit his job at General Electric to go back to the land. So I'm one of those kids who li lived the back to the land experience. Uh, we had- In, in Maine, In Maine, beautiful. oh, absolutely beautiful. Yeah. I, I loved it. And, I, and I, when I first moved to Maine at 12, I, I was kind of scornful because it seemed to me kind of a remote backwater. Um, that, of course, is the greatest thing about it. It is a little bit not a backwater, but it's it's a little bit remote from the life of the country. And uh, um, and and I now, you know, proudly uh, I, I, I proudly uh, associate myself with that wonderful state. But so there I was, age of twelve, um, living in uh, rural Maine uh, on a house that my father built with his own hands on land that I helped him clear, uh, with animals, uh, with an outhouse. We didn't have electricity for the first year or two that I lived there. We had kerosene lanterns. And so I was living the sort of the life of the frontier girl in the 1860s or 1880s. I'm picturing Abe Lincoln as your neighbor. Well, it was more like Laura Ingalls Wilder, actually. Uh, so when I read the Laura Ingalls Wilder books as a girl, uh, I understood exactly what was going on because much of the same kind of craftsmanship was taking place around me. We did eventually have electricity and I did, of course, go to a regular school. I didn't go to a one-room schoolhouse. I did go to a four-room schoolhouse, however. Middle school, four-room schoolhouse, quite the experience. Uh, yeah, so that's it. So I, I um, you know, I'm, I'm a nice modern taxpayer today with a mother of five children and a happy wife, but I did actually live the back-to-the-land experience back then. Uh, it was a wonderful way to grow up, and I, am, I feel immensely blessed that that's how life sorted it out, itself out for me. That's great. And, and and so how did storytelling, oral storytelling, become part of, of your life at, at that point? Well, I was a very, um, I, I, I would say that I was just, a, I was a voracious reader. I was one of those kids who, you know, read the cereal box. Uh, I couldn't be alone for five minutes without wanting to pick up something to read. I would come home from school and make some kind of grim snack for myself and immediately closet myself away upstairs in my room or up in a tree or on the roof of the, um, there's a little L off the house uh, where we kept wood and I would sometimes sit up there and read. Uh, so the oral part of it was more, was that I wouldn't say that that was a, that played a role in my life at that time. But when I was a girl, I read all the time as much as I could. Uh, and I, in fact, I was one of those kids, again, I don't think this is a unique experience, but I dedicated myself to reading my way through the school library, starting with A. And I, uh, I, I don't remember how far I got, but I wouldn't say that I probably got to the letter C. You know, you hit some of the, for me, in my case, hitting some of the nonfiction, I just couldn't go on. So you, you did a lot of reading 
And and now you've become an advocate for reading aloud. What, yeah. what is the significance of reading aloud to children? So I came to reading aloud the way that C.S. Lewis came to Christ. I was surprised by joy, honestly. Uh, I was, an, as I said to you before, I was an only child from a broken home. By the way, a phrase that my father and I joke about. So I say that with a certain amount of levity. I had a very happy childhood. Um, but I... Um, I didn't really know how to have what to do with babies when I had them. And the only thing I did know was this idea that you read to children. I had learned it from watching a friend of mine who'd had babies a few years earlier. And she would drop everything and read to her little sons. And I thought, you know what, if I ever have children, I'm going to do that. So when I did then have my first of what would be five babies, really, having grown up without children around me, without brothers and sisters, didn't know how to interact with a baby. But the one thing I did know was to read. And so right away, the, the books that I read with my daughter when she was first born uh, were like a tool that they trained me to be a mother. They trained me to understand where she was in her development. You know, when you have a baby on your lap and they're really young and you're reading, they don't they don't really know what's going on. You can't look at the pictures with them and say, you know, can you where's the witch or what is a witch to a, to a newborn baby? But as you read to them over the years, you know, they, they or over the months in the case of an infant, uh, the world, as it were, almost comes into focus for them. And the book is a wonderful way to elicit that from them, to, to help them develop themselves, but also so that you as a parent can see where they are. You start to see how the child will start to touch the page and you realize, oh, she knows what a balloon is, you know? Uh, so this is... Um, I feel that like I'm giving you a very long, long-winded answer to no, this. No, but what you, what, what I, the picture you're, you're creating for me, what you're, you're painting for me, is a bonding picture. Also, it isn't just an education, uh, you know, a stranger reading. It's this opportunity to bond with this newborn, and and that's that has to be a beautiful experience. I think that's right. So it was. So this is why I say that, like C.S. Lewis discovering Christianity, I was surprised by the joy of reading aloud by doing the reading aloud. And I knew over the years that I read to my children, um, you know, there were five of them. I read to them for probably a quarter century every night, really, and often for an hour. Uh, I knew something big was happening with us. I knew that it had this bonding effect that you describe. I knew that their vocabularies were very good, that their teachers always noticed this about them. I knew that stories and the, the stories and the dramas and things that we read were influential in their in the way that they saw themselves in the world. I could see that it enriched them, but it was really only uh, you know sort of late late on in that time that I thought you know as a journalist, there's more here. I think there must be something more here because what I am feeling about this experience cannot be unique to our family, and it was it turned out happily. There's all sorts of science and and data now that tells us that reading aloud is in fact it does have these miraculous effects. It does promote bonding with parents and children and among siblings. It does uh, enrich the minds, the imagination of children who are read to. Uh, it does strengthen their uh, intellectual growth, their cognitive and social emotional development. I mean, it's just, it's the bomb. It's great. It's got, it's got everything. <laughs> it's the bomb. I have to tell you, uh, one of my personal experiences, I, uh, I took a summer off and uh, spent the summer with my, my two children. And I'm guessing they were probably 12 and 9, 11 and 8, somewhere in, in that range. And so they were they were beyond, uh, you know, the the, the childhood uh, reading where the child can't read. Um, but I read Sea Biscuit, Laura Hill and Moran's uh, Sea Biscuit, and I, I I hadn't read it before. This was the first time I was reading it. And uh, it, what was really neat about it, one was it was really hot outside. And so we would go into the cool basement in the summertime. And so I had them captured. They, yeah. they didn't want to go upstairs and, and, and deal with the heat. And so I had them uh, trapped almost. Um, but as we went chapter to chapter, Dad, what are we going to read today? And it became this, and I hope it, it still is for them. It was a, it was a really life-altering experience for me. And, and I hope they have a, a positive memory of it as they raise uh, their children. But it was so, uh, so fascinating to read a book about a horse, not a person, about a horse who overcame these uh, obstacles in life, these challenges, and and succeeded and and became a, a national hero in a lot of ways during the the, the depression uh, era. 
And so it was, it was something that was really special. And when I had the opportunity to um, uh, read about you, I thought to myself, what, what, I just went back to that experience and how important that was. W what's your favorite book that you read uh, to your children? Oh, that is a tough one. That's like saying, which of the children is my favorite? <laughs> and there is no correct answer to that. Uh, I, well, you know, I, I, first of all, I want to say your story of, of reading Seabiscuit with your children, that I, that's such a, a marvelous and, and actually not uncommon experience. People sort of stumble back into reading aloud or they accidentally happen to do it because of a very hot summer or whatever. And it does have this revelatory experience or the, the revelatory depth to it. Wonderful. I mean, it's... I, I, that yours is not the first story of that kind I've heard. And I love it when we talk about these things, because again, it's like, you know, reading with our children or with our spouses or with our elderly parents, which is another way we can do it. Uh, it's, it's like touching some, it's like going back to a wellspring that is so refreshing that we as a culture have almost forgotten is there for us, waiting to replenish us with its delights. Um, but my favorite book, so, I would say that my favorite book to read with my children, and we probably read it maybe four or five times over the quarter century, was Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island. That book for our family had everything. It has adventure. It has fantastic characters. The character of Long John Silver, an amazing, roguish, admirable, wicked villain, a marvelous character. Uh, it has rich language, sometimes a little archaic, but if you read it, you know, at pace, it just makes perfect sense to the child who's listening. Scenes of drama and adventure. And for me, as the reader, I loved it because it's full of accents. And, you know, if you're a natural ham, as I'm afraid, I'm kind of a ham, uh, although I think I'm, I'm keeping my hamness in, in restraint here. <laughs> but, uh, you know, if you enjoy yourself reading aloud, as I really do, a book like Treasure Island just gives you huge scope, you know, there to, um, to have fun with accents, as I say, uh, to really kind of, you know, experience the vigor and beauty of language. Um, it's a wonderful book. So often in, in our lives, we get caught up. We're working a job, sometimes two jobs. We're, uh, we've got these responsibilities to pay bills and, and to mow the lawn and, and all of the things that go on in life. What advice would you give to parents about setting some time aside and reading aloud to, to children? Yeah, I, that's a very good question because I think parents are really, we're all trying to get it right. Uh, we beat ourselves up when we get it wrong. We have such limited time, it's very difficult. I would say that actually it is the busiest parents who need reading aloud the most. And here's why. It is in, its, in, in the time that you can give it, whether it's five minutes a day or 10 minutes a day or an hour a day if you can do it, in that time children receive Every, almost everything they need to thrive. They receive attention and comfort and the physical proximity of their parent. They receive uh, cognitive stimulation. They receive a kind of quick bath of language. They have the opportunity to voyage in their imaginations. They're, they get the sort of social emotional reinforcement that literature can give, the, the empathy that it imbues in us when we, when we read and experience a story involving other people. So, you know, all of these wonderful things, you know, brain development, social emotional learning, uh, bonding with a parent or a, 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 some other person who loves you, uh, you know, physical proximity to another person, which as we've seen in the pandemic is something we all need. We're, we're social animals. We need to have, you know, to be physiologically regulated. We need to be next to each other. We need to be touching each other. And so reading aloud gives you all of this. And you can, you know, if you've got five minutes, it's a, it's a sort of turbocharged way to be with your children. And that's why I think parents who are the busiest need it the most, because they may be the ones who have the least time, you know, leisure time with their children. And there's one part of reading aloud that I think we have to remember as well, and that is, especially with young children, um, is that it's, you know, the book is a story, right? It's this wonderful language, but it is also a kind of tool for conversation between parent and child. And one of the things that we see with the rise of technology is you know, the conversations that children and parents have are very much attenuated now. People talk to each other less than they used to because we all have our machines. And with a book, you know, just it might be an incidental conversation about, uh, you know, the uh, a picture of, I don't know, pigs eating pie or something. And the child says, well, I would like that pie. And, and the mother might say, well, I'd like that pie. And you might talk about why you chose the blueberry pie and the child chose the cherry pie, let's say. Well, that's that's language. That's an exchange. That's a connection. 
you know? And it might be something, let's say you're talking about a book, a more sophisticated book like Treasure Island, you might talk about how it is that a villain can also be charming, you know? That's a, there's a huge scope for discussion there. So a book is, a book is in itself this wonderful repository of, of, of imagination and language, but it's also a tool for connection and conversation. So, so how do you deal with the age difference? You had five children, mm -hmm. and, and how do you read to a child that's eight or nine years older than another child? So what we used to do is we would, we, I would gather everybody in, in the most comfy room that we could find, uh, and then we would read picture books, a stack of picture books to the littles. When they were small, of course, that was principally what we would read. Um, but even the older children, you know, have a kind of nostalgic pleasure in reading or in being part of listening to a children's uh, to, to a picture book, excuse me. Uh, and then and then the little ones might get off my lap when I'd read the picture books and they might play on the floor or roll around or, you know, dance or whatever they want to do or play with Lego. And then I would read a chapter or two of a chapter book to the older children. But essentially, what every, everyone was getting the story, everyone was getting everything. So the little children were getting the more sophisticated language of a chapter book, and the older children were getting the, the coziness and the simplicity of the picture books, which I should say, not all picture books are very simple. Sometimes they're very, very complex. But at any rate, you know, you get these different levels and everyone would get them and they could sort of take them in at, at the speed that was appropriate for them. So, you know, if you're if you're the little toddler playing on the floor while your mother's reading Treasure Island, it's mostly going to go over your head. But you may also imbue from that experience the way that the older children are drinking it in. You see they're modeling, you know, the appreciation of a story for the younger child. Uh, and then as, as we saw, again, I keep going back to this book, The Treasure Island, just because it was such a wonderful example of this. I, I really think that uh, the fact that my younger children heard it before they were able to understand it meant that when we came back to the book and they were able to understand it, it reverberated with a special power for them because in some way they were already imprinted with the story and the language. And so in some way it was like a, a return, a coming home. Uh, and, and there are lots of books that, that provide that possibility, I think, for families. I don't want to constantly be on the Robert Louis Stevenson bandwagon here, but he, he is a genius. And uh, I, we do celebrate his birthday, November 13th, every year at our house. <laughs> nice plug for the <laughs> Yeah, birthday. for Robert Louis Stevenson. <laughs> uh, so, you know, you, you have uh, really a fascinating career in a lot of ways. You, you were a correspondent. Um, you were... Uh, really traveled the world yeah. covering covering stories before you had children. Yeah. Um, did the opportunity to read to children, was it also an opportunity to talk about the values that you received, that, that, that you gained from your childhood um, in, in Maine or your experiences? How did you sort of bridge that, um, uh, that intellectual uh, the, the, the successes that you've had with the through the book through reading a book with with your children so when i was choosing books for my children you know it's such a it's such a it's an art not a science i suppose it's a little like that what my work is now i um i suppose if i had a bias it was always for books about adventure i loved reading to them stories of adventure of of of, of conflict and triumph uh i never i think set out we did try to read some of the book of, you know, William Bennett's Book of Virtues and some of those stories and things. But I, I didn't really try to, I didn't set out to um, imbue specific virtues. I really wanted more. Uh, there's a wonderful Chesterton saying about how we should, oh, what is it, something like uh, we want to to give children an idea of the world both as, as welcome and invitation. I'm mangling that horribly. But I, I wanted the books to open the world to them. Uh, to convey the kind of adventure, the drama uh, of that the world holds, that is, um, that is something we see when we travel, right? Uh, it's something we can experience to, to lift them up out of our our current time, to lift them up out of our current you know, the way our family was, and to really open the world to them. Uh, not sure that really answers your question, but um, I loved. You know, there were certain holes in my own education. And so sometimes I would read books with them that I wanted to read or wanted to know better. Um, I, I loved reading the Iliad and the Odyssey to them. I mostly, I will say, did not read them the 
abridged, you know, translations. We read abridged translations. Um, but those stories have been, I mean, they're just such deep and rich and wonderful and stirring stories with, that have their, as it were, they, so they form sort of the root network for our culture. We have the story of an odyssey, you know, of, 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 of contending with dangers on the seas as Odysseus did. The wonderful, there's both, it's a kind of, there are parables within that, there are, there are uh, metaphors for our own way of life. So I, I sought to read them very kind of content rich stories that would open the world to them. So um, I, I guess one of the things I'm wondering about is, is did they, and my kids did this uh, with me. Um, I, I would read a story and, and read, uh, uh, the, the reading would be about a dangerous situation, for example, yeah. and and one of my children would interrupt me and say, "Well, what was the most dangerous situation you were in?" And and sometimes I made up, a, you know, a wrestling match with a grizzly bear or, or something for these little kids. But um, other times we would talk about the stresses of life. And I was a a prosecutor at the time, and and uh, you know, and, and I'm just wondering whether the the opportunity to read aloud to a child is also the opportunity to talk about some of your life and. and in, in the lessons you've learned uh, and, and, and really be able to, to help that child understand where you're coming from. You know, I think that's right. I think that's, that's actually absolutely right. I should have mentioned it myself. Uh, I do think, again, we have this idea of the book as uh, not, just a, not just a repository of its own stories, but a, a tool, a mechanism for eliciting conversation and telling our own stories. As you as you say, um, yes, absolutely, that's right, uh, and and it's um, it's also a prompt to oneself. You know, do you? I think we often, as parents, we can forget to tell our children about the things that made us, about the influences that shaped us, uh, and when we encounter stories in books, we can. It's that's right. It's a way. It's a way to. It's a way to um, to remind ourselves that not just the stories in books are important for them to know, but their own stories. Uh, there have been some w wonderful books. Actually, there's a lovely picture book that just came out called Watercress. Uh, it's, a, it's a picture book written by, uh, forgive me, I'm going to forget the name both of the author and illustrator, um, but it tells the story of a girl of Chinese heritage growing up in Ohio and her deep embarrassment when her parents would pull over to the side of the road and, um, and, and, and cut watercress and other kind of edible vegetables that were just growing wild. She was mortified. You know, vegetables come from the supermarket. What she didn't know and what is related in this wonderful picture book is that in her mother's case, you know, she'd survived the Maoist times and lost her little brother to starvation. And people who have gone through that kind of hideous, you know, crucible, um, you know, never lose their, their, uh, their fear, I think, of of not having plenty, and those of us who raised in America. I mean, that's the that's the ultimate immigrant story of America, isn't it? Right. Generation after generation who come, who fight to get here, and to uh, to imbue their children with the values of hard work and appreciating. You know, that's the American story to appreciating what America has to offer, um, and it's the luxury of the ch to be a child of immigrants, as I am a child of one immigrant. Uh, it's a luxury that you think that you don't ever have to worry about the things that shaped your own parents. So, again, I, I, I feel as though I'm giving you a rather convoluted answer. No, it seems to be my, it's my, <laughs> but uh, but I do think that that picture books, you know, and, and children's books do allow us to to bring these stories out more easily. So a few weeks ago, I went uh, shopping um, and I was looking for a book for my uh, grandson, uh, Bear. It's not his real name, but that's yeah. what I call him. Yeah. I have to give everybody a, a nickname. And, and as I was going through the children's book section, I was stunned by the political messages that were getting in books. You mentioned your uh, really love for adventure books. I, I didn't see adventure books. I saw political books. I saw books that uh, were sending a message that was disturbing to me, but, but certainly not in keeping with the idea of, of uh, uh, talking to a young person about how thrilling life is and, and all of the, the real optimism that they should have for, for the future. W what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I'm seeing in the world of children's books the same thing, the phenomenon that we're seeing all over the culture. It's as though this new sensibility of identity politics, it's been in the groundwater, you know, it's been, it's been coming, it's been rising for a long time, and then suddenly it's like we're flooding all over the place. I, it is remarkable to me the degree to which the publishing industry and the librarians of America are committing themselves wholeheartedly to a world of books that 
uh, is focused on identity, as if identity is a story. It's not a story. It's a thing, right? We all, and I mean, people from all over the world have identities. It's, it's just, it's this, it's this very depressing fashion that the idea that the color of your skin or perhaps your religion is the single most important thing about you, that that is what identifies you, uh, as though, as though you are not a human being first, but a human being of one color or another first. Uh, it's a horrible abandonment, I think, of, uh, of what has been this marvelous birthright that belongs to all children uh, of literature and art and storytelling. Uh, all stories are not going to be about all people. Uh, those stories that are specifically, the, well, one of the things we see with children's books now is that every child, publishers and writers and illustrators are trying to depict almost every, every color of person in every picture. And it's just, it reflects an unreality. It's not that we don't have a country of all sorts of different people. It's that it gives you a distorted, it's, 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 not, it's not real. And if, 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 if books aren't, if they don't have a feeling of reality, I mean, a book can be set on the moon. It can be set in outer space. It can be set on a treasure island. But there has to be a kind of human and moral truth to it. And one of the things that I see happening now is that publishers, writers, and illustrators seem to be abandoning what is real in favor of what to them is politically ideal. And one of the things that amazed me when I was looking for this book for Bayer was I didn't see a lot of the books that I was familiar with. It's almost like we've thrown out the, 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 what I would call the classics of children's literature and we've replaced them. Uh, we've canceled, <laughs> for, for using a, a common word, uh, the, the classics of children's literature and we've replaced them with this, uh, this woke, uh, you know, um, uh, popular kind of, of literature. Um, is it is it easy to still find the treasure islands of, of the world, the treasures? Uh, the treasures. I you know I I mean I do. I will say that this is a this is a this is a difficulty for me as a book critic. I have there are so many books that I would not wish to recommend to anyone. Uh, that I have to look hard to find. I mean, there are wonderful books, don't get me wrong. And I, I don't want in any way to inculpate the entire book industry or all writers and illustrators. There are some fantastically talented and imaginative people working. Um, some of them are putting their talents, I think, in ways that are regrettable, but that's a separate thing. Uh, I, I, I do try to find wonderful books to talk about. I have one of the things I've discovered is that even if I'm if I find a book I really dislike and I slam it, some readers don't understand that uh, that they, they they're not not everybody reads carefully, and so the fact that a book appears in the column sometimes will seem as though it has my imprimatur, and I have to sometimes tell people, no, no, I didn't recommend that. I was actually telling you it's a bad book. Um, it's a it's a it's a balance, right? I my job at the Wall Street Journal. Uh, I, you know, I'm working for our readers. I'm working for grandfathers like you and parents like your kids and well, whoever reads our reads the newspaper, to help them find, to help them navigate their way through this kind of increasingly woke world of children's books, to find the books that they can feel feel good about reading with their children. Um, I'm not some kind of you know school marm. I'm not you know I don't I'm not you know horribly censorious. I think some I'm I'm happy for there to be, you know, a, a lively mix of books. Um, and I try to represent a bit of you know what's going on in the industry and what I write about, um, but ultimately, ultimately, you know, the service is to help people find good books, and they they absolutely are out there. So you wrote a book. You're not just a book critic. <laughs> right. You wrote a book, The right. Enchanted Hour. Right. Uh, tell me about that book. So The Enchanted Hour uh, is a book that arose from this 25 years of reading aloud to my own children. Uh, and also from my interest as a journalist in what was going on during that time that I was reading to them. And the book is essentially, it's, it's I decided to pack in everything I could. I once heard a, a wonderful novelist say, you know, when he was writing his first book, he wasn't sure he'd ever get the chance to write a second one. So he put everything he could into his first book. And that's what I did with this. So I, what I do in The Enchanted Hour is I look at reading aloud, um, all its different, you know, if it's a giant gem, let's say, looking at the different facets. So what it does for the brain, the developing brain of children, kind of remarkable what reading aloud does, what it does for the heart of a child, what it does for the bonding of a parent and child, what it does for to turbocharge child development, how also it uh, enriches a child's uh, language uh, and, and 
very much accelerates their development when they get to school. It's very helpful for children to be read to before they get to school. Um, what it does even to uplift children who didn't have that early experience, if you can get to them when they're a little bit older. Uh, the role it plays in developing imagination and also in cultural literacy, you know? If, if when parents and teachers read profound and uh, sort of uh, you know, foundational books, fairy tales, mythology, poetry, all kinds of things, you know, even the, the stories of Shakespeare, if not Shakespeare himself, um, when you infuse children with this kind of wonderful content, you equip them to understand the world that's around them. You equip them to understand story arcs. You know, you you equip them to understand how books work. So all of this is packed in there. Uh, I will say there's also one chapter, uh, which I think could have been a book in itself, and that is about what reading aloud can do for the older brain, for the older person, uh, in the context of marriage and later life, uh, even up until the deathbed. You know, mm -hmm. reading aloud has this marvelous ability to lift us up out of where we are. If I read to you, I'm giving you the gift of a story understood with ease through your ears, you know, but through speech. Mm -hmm. If you can't see, if you're very ill, if you're stuck in the hospital and all you can think about is what your diagnosis is, if I read to you, I get you to come up out of that with me into the world of something else. So it's a, it's a, it's a marvelous gift. Your book's been translated into different languages. It what's has. what's the significance of that? I are there, to you? Yes, to me. Well, first of all, I, it's um, it's a, it's a great honor to be translated. Um, I believe I'm translated now in German, uh, in Spanish. There's one coming in Chinese, incredibly, which is wonderful, um, and I believe Romanian and Korean as well. Uh, those are in the works. Um, what that means to me is that publishers see that there is a hunger for this and a need for this, uh, that families that families need it, that it resonates with them. And there are parts of the world where reading aloud is very much established as a, a family practice. In Germany, for instance, uh, the book has done well there, I think, because it's very validating for German families that read. Um, but in some parts of the world, reading aloud is not so common. Um, as I understand it, this is entirely anecdotal. In some Latin American countries, it isn't really a practice. Um, in some societies, books are venerated objects, and therefore not something you would just let a child, you know, chew on or play with or interact with. It's, you know, no, 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 don't touch that book. And so uh, what I, I'm very excited about the book being in Spanish because it helps get the message out to families in Spanish-speaking countries and Spanish-speaking families in this country, you know, that reading aloud is for you. It has all of these magical things to offer. And it's free. You know, Ken, that's the thing. Reading aloud is something, it's free. You can read almost anything, or certainly to an infant, you can read anything. You can read a baby, you can read the newspaper to your baby, or you can read the, you know, I don't know, the cereal box to a baby. It's blah, blah, blah to the baby, but at least you're speaking to the child. Um, but really, anything that comes to hand can be something to read. May I add one thing to that? Yeah, absolutely. So sometimes people will say, uh, yes, yes, well, you can read, you're literate, it's easy for you. Um, and that's true. Reading aloud is easy for me because I'm a ham and I love literature and I love language and I'm, I'm tolerably good at it. But the wonderful thing about um, the book as a tool of conversation, as we were talking about, and of, and of eliciting family stories and that kind of thing, is that any text, any pictures can be used as a picture book. Uh, a mother who is not confident in her and let's say she lives in, let's say she lives in Spain and she's an English speaker and she doesn't have any English books. She could look through a cookbook with her child and she could tell stories about the things that she sees in the pictures. So again, the book can be a tool for conversation and to you make up stories about the things you see in the pictures. You don't actually have to be able to read to read aloud. Well, Megan, I want to thank you for uh, that description. And I also want to uh, ask you a question that I ask all my guests. Um, and the question is, if loving this is wrong, I don't want to be right. And the question is, what is this? Uh, okay. All right. I've got one for you. Uh, manliness. What is that? Manliness. Oh, interesting. Uh, there was a, a little bit of a testy conversation at a dinner party I was at the other night. Um, everyone was vaccinated, I will just say. Uh, <laughs> someone at the table brought up the topic of toxic masculinity. And I have to say, I really bridled at that because I feel it is such a slur on men. 
Uh, and manliness is something I really value. I, the uh, tenderness of a father, the protectiveness of a husband, uh, the chivalry of a son, you know, I've experienced all of these things. And I think it is wrong for us to dismiss others in these huge categories. Uh, and I think that if we're going to talk about toxic anything, as any woman will tell you, let us talk about toxic femininity. So manliness is the thing. That's what I would say. If loving manliness is wrong, I don't want to be right. That's great. <laughs> and I didn't prompt you. You did not. <laughs> Well, thank you. I want to thank Megan for shooting straight with us, and I want to thank you for listening today. I hope this program has been informative, enlightening, and uniting. As Americans navigate this world of distractions, I hope you find ways to take Megan's recommendations for reading as a family and seeking out lasting literature. For more straight shooting programs, go to my website, shootingstraightpodcast.com. If you've enjoyed this show and have ideas about future topics or guests, shoot me an email, ken at shootingstraightpodcast.com. God bless you, and remember to always shoot straight.